<clears throat> Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number 141 with me, your host, Agostino Zinga. What's going on? What's happening? What's crackalacking? What's happening over there? Hope you guys are doing well. Well hydrated, well rested, well lubricated. You've got all your, you know, bodily functions are where they need to be. Your limbs are in place. Uh, your arm is where your arm's meant to be and not, you know, attached to the middle of your forehead. Your toes look like toes and not like thumbs and all that good stuff. And I hope you're well, man. And in case you're wondering, I'm doing splendid, absolutely splendid as per usual, because that's everything I do in the mornings per usual is go and work out before I then carry on the rest of my day, which I have to get off in a bit. So this might be a little bit of a quick one, but we're going to run through the stuff. But if you're asking how I'm doing, I'm doing great. I got back from the gym an hour or so ago and my shoulder is a bit tweaked um, as it may be, as maybe a consequence of me doing maybe too many overhead presses. I did like a set of five today of um of deadlifts and overhead presses because as per usual, the bench press was occupied. The bench press in that gym is probably the most well-used, frequently occupied thing in the world. Like the squat rack, sometimes no one's touching it. The what you call it the what's the, it's a platform right the little platform where people go and do deadlifts and all that sort of stuff no one touches it for the most part but the fucking bench press is insanely busy i've never there's never been a time unless like usually i go early in the morning so i go between the hours of like six and set six and eight but if i leave later and i go half seven then usually it's a lot it's getting a lot more busier but the only time I've ever seen it free is that little window just after 7 or 7 a.m. Because the, the guys that go to gym at 6 to 7, they usually bounce because they've done the hour. They usually get ready and go to work. And then the people that are coming in later, like me, we can sometimes find a little window. Where you can sometimes find the weight, the free weights area a bit freed up. But usually, for the most part, the bench press is always busy. Always somebody on a bench press. And if I'm being mean, which I don't intend to be mean, but if I'm being ultrally mean, the people on the bench press look like, you know, the last thing they should be worrying about is being on the bench press. Let's just say that, right? They should be worrying about other things, but they're so enamored with this idea of getting those. But maybe it's not that. Maybe it's just because, you know, usually the gym guy has that stereotypical body or has that kind of gym body where they usually only focus on their upper body and don't focus on their legs. So their legs are super skinny, but they've got an, a really well-defined or big muscular upper body because all they're concentrating on is that kind of, you know, overhead um, sort of presses with dumbbells on the on the little mach- on the little seat thing that they rank up sometimes, or they might do loads of curls or loads of um, what do you call it um, tees kind of whatever they call when you have the dumbbell and you bring it up to you up to you and the kind of fist is facing downwards. Um, so a lot of bench pre- and and again a lot of bench presses maybe to focus on the chest and the shoulders. But whatever they're doing, someone's got to tell them that you have to be worrying about other things. In my opinion, again, it's just my opinion, but I think she thinks of other things. But you know, that's always busy, so I'm always having to kind of crank up the sets on the squat rack or the bench press because I don't, so all the platforms with deadlift because I don't want to be that guy waiting around the weight area and waiting for someone to finish. You know, just and I, I hated it when people do it to me when they're like, "Oh, how many left? How many left?" Like, just wait until I finish, then you can go on it. Do you know what I mean? Let's not communicate here. Um, let's stop with the communication. No comunicado, okay? No comunicado. Sorry, no say, no say, okay? No say. Um but yeah, that was that was fairly enjoyable. And I think I might tweak the little bit something in my neck or in my shoulder blades. It came a little bit stiff, but you know, I powered through that motherfucker. And then I finished off my sets doing a four four hundred meter rows with twenty kettlebell swings and ten push ups, which was fairly decent. And kind of finished by then. I was I finished out about fifty minutes, I think, overall from start to finish. So I really try and pack in as much as I can. I go super hard, super intense. And then kind of get out, get the fuck out of there. No hanging around, no being on my phone, browsing on browsing the internet on the Wi-Fi and shit. Like none of that. Just get in and out. Plus that place isn't the most um, enjoyable, hub, habitable place to hang about in, you know? A gym with no windows um, isn't the best place to hang around with when everyone's just, you know, or no windows that you can open when everyone's just kind of, you know, um, sucking, in, sucking in each other's perspiration and bodily fluids. It's not the best place to really spend your weekends or weekdays for the most part so yeah ran out there and now i'm here with my hands a bit you know sore and fucked up but you know we do what we have to do because we have to do what we do so on to subject something i saw quickly actually which was something that very interested me 
was um, this debate that I've been hearing, uh, being spoken about a lot with, um, in terms of teams, you know, playing in the FA Cup, the FA Cup draw happened the other day, United drew Arsenal, which is quite cool, the rest of the other draw is a little bit, you know, a little bit flat, but it's interesting in English football that there's this weird uh, taboo, or well, there's not weird taboo, there's this weird thing in English football where some of the mid mid table sides, like Leicester, for instance, would rather field an understrength side in the FA Cup, rotate the entire team or entire squad, not really care if they go out, but then maintain all their fuck, put all their energy into the Premier League when they're not going to do anything, right? They're not going to win the league, they're not going to finish top four, not going to get relegated. They're in that weird sort of like you know safety spot that Everton used to occupy when they were managed with, under David Moyes. But they don't want to try and win one trophy, especially a trophy that ma- at the FA Cup that's got a bit of magic towards it, that kind of you know captures the imagination of the British public or, or the nation over. But they don't want to do that. They'd rather just you know scrap in the Premier League for what? It's very very weird uh, procedure, and it kind of maybe made me think of it more the other day because obviously Liverpool lost against Wolves two one, and they fielded a pretty understrength side. And yeah, don't get me wrong, Liverpool are f- at top of the Premier League at the moment. They're fighting pretty hard in the Champions League, maybe one of the strongest teams in Europe. But I think as we pr- as proved with that side that field played against Wolves, you know, it's kind of their second string kind of side. Maybe not their second, maybe a bit of their third and second string involved there with some of the kids involved. But I think everyone can attest, or anyone that watches football can agree, that Liverpool are only maybe two or three injuries away from their whole season capitulating, right? They don't really, you know, if a, if a, if a, if a Virgil van Dijk or a Mo Salah, or God forbid, uh, Alisson gets injured, they're essentially fucked. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, if anything, they should be trying to win every single game they can with the players they have available, get to as far as they can in a cup competition, and then hope that they can, you know, if that, if they do get injured to their big players, some of their second or third string can kind of pick up the mantle and kind of, you know, get them over the line. But I don't understand why Liverpool, as a team, aren't getting more criticised, or Jurgen Klopp for that case, for fielding on the strength side. Like, I know you're top of the league, but part of the reason, part of the way of winning a league, or part of the reason that you can go quite far in cup competitions, is when you go fighting on all fronts, right? Because effectively, Liverpool aren't going to finish outside the top four, right? Because they're, you know, don't get me wrong. You're, if, you're, if you're first, you want to win the league. But let's say, worst case scenario, you're not going to finish outside the top four, right? You're going to be, you're going to make a good fist of it in a Champions League for sure, because, you know, they're as good as any other side in Europe. So why not try and, and win the, the FA Cup? Why not try and get a trophy in your cabinet? I never understood that. It's just something that really, really um, baffles me for the most part. Um, the game itself was fairly interesting. I think um, seeing the save from John Ruddy again, which I think goes to show just how high the level is in football. Um of the standard of, of goalkeeping right now. Do you remember back in the day, there used to be a time when your second street, your second choice goalkeeper was an absolute, you know, journeyman, right? Someone who you wouldn't trust playing in, in your Saturday league side, right? But nowadays, like number ones and number twos are as good as each other, right? They're both kind of fighting for that number one spot. And usually the best keepers are usually playing for the best, better clubs, you know? So, and just in terms of just that general athleticism is incredible. So this is a good example of it. There's this save from John Ruddy against uh, Gredan Shakiri's uh, free kick against Wolves. And I thought it was just fucking fabulous, just in terms of just uh, pure athleticism involved in it. And again, John Ruddy is the goalkeeper who, you know, is kind of the forgotten man having left Norwich. He kind of did pulled up trees in. I think he was meant to be in the U- England squad, wasn't he? And then he kind of, was it the Euros? I think it might have been the Euros and he kind of got a big injury that kind of set him back. But a really highly rated goalkeeper and he pulled off this like insane save. Look at that against Shakiri. I think they got the referee didn't judge it as a as a save, but that definitely was a save. Fingertips onto the onto the crossbar, and it kind of goes along the line and kind of goes out of play. Insane, insane, insane goalkeeping from a really really high high level goalkeeper. So yeah, I I just, I just don't get it. I just I just don't get it. Uh, Liverpool should be trying to win everything. I think you're, they're probably their fans might say, oh no, we want to win Champions League, it's different, blah, blah, blah. I think at that level, if you're a goalkeeper, if you're a player of playing for those kind of teams, you want to win the games and you want to win trophies. You want to get them in the trophy cabinet and have a winning mentality. And that kind of brings the kind of club together or the team together in order to kind of fight the challenges that are yet to come. I just don't understand it personally. I just don't get it. The money, the law, don't get me wrong with that stuff. But from my kind of like basic thinking, winning games makes a club more, you know, um, makes the club more appealing, right? 
you have people saying that no, you should win, try and win the Champions League. But I, I just, I just don't understand it. I just don't get it. I don't get it. There was a really actually a good debate about this actually a, a minute ago on um, BT Sport. They were talking about it, and I didn't really understand. Again, it's, really it's just something that doesn't really make sense to me. But let me play this now, and I'll just see what it can say quickly here. Jermaine Ginnis and a few other people speaking on BT Sport about it. Get it up on there. Let's play this bad boy. So what do we think? Finish fourth or win the FA Cup? Unfortunately, I didn't do either. Um, but let's start with you, Rich. <laughs> you won the FA Cup uh, when you were fifth. Um, sorry, lost when you were 15. Won it 16 years later. So FA Cup or Champions League? Uh, well, with the women's FA Cup, I think. Uh, now Champions League. I would go Champions League. Talking about the men's football, as a you know low-key Burnley fan. Uh, I'd take the FA Cup. Would you over Champions League yeah, over Burnley? Absolutely, yeah. And I think Everton fans, you know, that's my former Everton club as well. Why, why, why would you? Why would you take the FA well, Cup? Well, because we tried Europe and it didn't really work out for us. You so, know, uh, you we, know, one we, of the things you might be just, which, I'm not going to talk badly of the FA Cup, but the monetary aspect of oh. winning the FA Cup in comparison to getting yourself into the Champions League is chalk and cheese that would have a huge impact on a club like Burnley. So I know that like, you say the squad and so on and so forth, but... But again, the Champions League thing, the money, okay, Jimmy just makes a good point. Maybe the money is you get more money for winning the top four. For Sorry, for finishing. I'm going to say, imagine me saying winning the top four. For finishing in the top four. And obviously a lot of prestige comes from it, from the European sides and stuff and European sponsors and world sponsors, whatever it may be. But as we've seen with Rangers and Celtic, they're in the Champions League every single season, right? And maybe Kilmarnock or Hearts might finish the top two and kind of knock them out of it, whatever it may be. But who cares? Celtic going to the Champions League and it's just like, it's just a blip. It, they might as well not be there, right? Um, this argument that it, it makes you, you attract better players. Also, I don't agree. Celtic and Rangers are a good example. They play in a, essentially a two-team league, right? For the most part. Maybe some occasions, some seasons, if Kilmarnock and Hearts can keep on to good players, it can be a three-team league. But, you know, essentially, you know, it's it's flat-track bullying for them. They don't attract the best players. Um, Celtic just signed um, George Ware's son from PSG on loan, right? For the half of the season. They don't attract the, the players that all the clubs are after. They attract players who are kind of on their way who maybe you need to reco recover their or uh, rebuild their reputation or young players like like George like Timothy Ware he needs to kind of build a bit of a reputation for himself and get some games under his belt but the best talent aren't going to play for uh, Rangers or Celtic for that regard just because they win the Champions League but what actually gets Rangers and Celtic fans excited is the fact that they win the league so that they might win the Scottish Cup so I don't understand if you're a Burnley why you'd rather finish in the top four why? So you can just go in the Champions League and get spanked by some journey for, by some by, by a team he never knew existed. It doesn't make any sort of sense. Um, and again, it just, it just goes to show just how warped the sense of thinking of is in in the UK. I think we've we slowly come away from the whole um, hoof um, football, right? So most societies, even like look at Everton, right? They have Marco Silva. They play football from the back. I think we've come out of that kind of you know bubble of teams outside the top four playing horrible football but I think the last kind of thing to kind of die is this idea that just finishing just surviving is enough and not caring about competitions right that that, that needs to die I think that that idea of surviving is basically a cup needs to die but the more I'm thinking about it the more I'm just trying to understand I'm trying to imagine that there might be a time right in the future where the Premier League introduces a trophy for finishing in the top four or finishing in the top six or something. There might be an actual trophy they might give to people. It sounds crazy. It sounds ridiculous, but I think they might do it. They might actually give you a trophy to lift up and to kind of kiss and shit for finishing the top four, which is fucking insane to think about it. Because it's like, you know, you've you've kind of made the entry requirements, right? You've you've qualified for the race and then you'll get a trophy. It's like, that doesn't make any sort of sense. And kind of goes back to what I said before in our podcast about um, the rate of like people turning up to big races like the London Marathon, the kind of like you know the no show rate is super high because essentially you get rewarded because you're you landed a spot in a very coveted race, right? A race is oversubscribed, you got a spot, and that feels like a victory in itself. And people make it seem or make you feel as if it is a victory. Or the company itself, Virgin, might send you a little uh, shareable graphic that you can share on your Instagram or on your Facebook that says, "Oh, I got into the thing, cheer me on, blah blah blah," and that feels like a victory, right? when you get those dopamine hits of people kind of liking your picture or your status that's already a win when really the win is crossing the finishing line the win is actually turning up on a day and doing the job the win isn't finishing a top four the win is lifting a trophy aloft your head and kissing and saying look at the journey we came on but hey ho 
what do I know? That's like a short thing. But yeah, let's see. I, I, again, it'll be fucking interesting and super funny if at the end of the season, Liverpool finish completely trophyless, right? They'll look back on this FA Cup run and think, we could have probably done something. Imagine, it's a favourable tie. Most of the big teams are getting kept apart for the most for the most part, apart from Arsenal and Man United. Why not try and win the Champions? Why not try and win the FA Cup? It'll be interesting. Imagine, Man City pip, uh, piped them to the Premier League by a couple of points. They get knocked out of Champions League and they'll win comp- incredibly trophyless. Then what's the point of having a great side? You have to have some trophies to win alongside. It's not enough just playing good football. In my opinion, again, it's not enough. It's not enough. Um, anyways, apart from that, what else was on the list today? Oh, some shows from yesterday. Um, I reviewed a couple of shows that happened at London Fashion Week that I thought were quite interesting or quite cool. Um, it's sort of wrapped up now already. I think they've headed, they're heading off. Why is the camera always so bent like that? It should be like that, shouldn't it, right? It's always bent. I don't know why. Maybe it's the floor that's bent. See, the, the shelving is a bit like that, right? But anyway, who cares? Um... It's now headed off to Milan, and then it's going to head off to Paris, I'm assuming, right? And then, yeah, and then that's kind of basically it. So, it's heading off. It's London Fashion Week's a wrap. It's been a pretty good one, I think, for the most part. I think all the, the people that you expected to kind of uh, show and perform uh, well have done so. The Craig Greens of this world and all that malarkey were kind of there again. And basically, you know, may effectively, I wouldn't say set the bar, but, you know, did what they usually do. Some people say it's the same thing over and over again. But I think there is a real talent in kind of honing a particular shape, right? Oh, season in, season out. Because you could argue the same could be said for Rick Owens, right? Um, once you've seen one Rick Owens show, you might have seen maybe all of them. But in every season, he's able to kind of hone his overall design DNA and kind of use it in different shapes, different sort of materials, different sort of patterns. It's all kind of interesting. It's all kind of a, a bit, it's all built on season in, season out, right? So the Craig Green idea, I'm a big fan of. And there's been a couple of other shows that I've also been a big fan of. I'm going to get up here on the screen. Let me make this full screen first. Display capture, transform, edit, fit to screen. There we go. So, um, first one I think that was cool was a cold war. I'm I'm gonna say something that I'm gonna I didn't think of that I only thought of this morning, but I watched the Cold War live stream as it was going on. And obviously, I saw that they had um, another kind of performative element associated with this one. I think the one before had had a guy cracking some guy that was naked, painted red um, or dyed red, who was kind of cracking out of a box um, with these weird sort of like wave type of creatures kind of running around him with their hair sort of like slicked back, which looked amazing, right? And um, very apropos, considering that it was just a season before Virgil was going to show the first collection at Louis Vuitton and Sammy Ross being Virgil's uh, protege. It was something there was something that resonated quite well with that. And obviously it being one of the shows after the whole investment bump and then really kind of really trying to ramp up the production. It really seemed that they were kind of a cold war kind of going for it. Sammy Ross was trying to put his flag in the ground and saying, that, you know, I'm here to stay. I'm a big designer in London. Right. And obviously, you know, with Virgil showing in Paris the, the the following days after, it really kind of set the bar and kind of showed, okay, Virgil had to really bring it in terms of what he was going to present. So I liked it. But then sometimes with me, I think with performative, I think Rick Owens has mentioned it a couple of times with his kind of um, uh, runway um, designs that he does. I think sometimes there can be a feeling, especially for some of the sort of heady, um, avant-garde maybe intellectual designers out there they can maybe get a bit too smart for their own good and they can maybe sometimes um what do you call it over dramatize their collection in terms in in order to add something to it but essentially what they're doing is that they're taking away from the collection because it can sometimes be a bit distracting so cold war i'm a fan of i love i love samuel ross's kind of overall perspective i think sometimes he can get a bit waffling in his interviews and i think sometimes he, he's for the sake of trying to sound intelligent he'll use kind of really big um big words to describe something that he can probably describe in layman's terms for the most part but i think what he's trying to do and what he's pushing out there in terms of what he represents as a young black man living in london uh trying to break into the fashion scene and trying to do it on his own terms um with a very pacific pacific point of view and story that he's telling i think all those other things i mentioned before can fall to the wayside i think he is again i think a lot like virgil it's I, I i don't really i'm not it's weird to say but i don't i don't really take i don't really um try and over criticize their work i just think what they represent is far greater than their work that they're doing it's not to say that just because they're black i'm supporting them no it's just that i think when the general scheme of things looking at the landscape of fashion looking at the people in different sort of houses looking at the voices that are being look at the voices that are being propelled looking at that voice the voices that keep getting the same sort of amount the same sort of gigs 
all these things around there in terms of the politics that are involved in the fashion industry, I think it's really important to have Virgil and Sammy Ross at different kind of ends of the kind of fashion hierarchy or in a different sort of areas, whatever they might occupy, in order for the fans or the consumers out there to kind of see that that is possible and to want to do it too. When I first got involved in streetwear, when I went involved in the scene, my passion was to be, um, you know, a James Jebbia, right? Somebody that's involved in terms of making things happen, right? I didn't necessarily just want to be a consumer or just uh, a customer, right? I wanted to be someone making the thing, and I didn't see any, I didn't see any difference between a James Jebbia and myself, right? I saw, a, I saw somebody that was had an amazing idea, executed it, it hit. And it just went right but i just think we're all capable of doing it but it just takes a bit of guts takes a bit of courage in order to kind of do it yourself the first in the in the first place but there are the there are a population of people out there who don't necessarily see themselves reflected in you know in the people that own these brands and own these companies and don't necessarily think and and feel that they need to be given permission and obviously i don't agree with that point of view but people like that do exist right so they need to be given uh they need to be given a chance permission to do something and the way that it can be done is by uh, people that look like you doing the thing that you want to do. And you always automatically are going to be like, oh, I can do that too, can't I? Oh, I can do it my own way. That's what, exactly what you need. So sometimes, you know, I can I can kind of see both sides. I can see why some people would criticize a Virgil and a Sammy Ross because they're, you know, they're bloody masters of PR, right? They're masters at positioning themselves in certain ways, right? They're masters at trying to make people, they're masters of getting their voices in certain publications, whether it's Virgil, you know, um, fucking um, spamming uh, all the kind of contemporary art news sites with interviews and features when he was at Design Miami whether it's uh, Sammy Ross getting his interviews in certain places, long-form interviews, blah, 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 all this sort of stuff and mentioning the projects he's doing outside of it. The particular reason why these guys are blowing up is because they've been able to understand, you know, the design element bits of it. They've been able to tap into what's going on in the cultural side, guys. And obviously, they're the masters of self-promotion. They do it in their own way. And even Sammy Ross isn't as kind of um, um, front-facing or as, you know, as kind of a sh not shameless but you know as as bombastic as maybe Virgil is about talking about himself but they still do it in expert ways and it's no surprise that they win these awards that they're all over the place that you know Sam Ross's uh, collection is stocked in maybe over a hundred stockists now at the moment he's raking in the money it's because they're able to kind of mold these things together so I think sometimes when people criticize I think they criticize from the point of view of like yes there may be more skilled designers out there who should be getting more recognition but just like in the music industry just like in the contemporary art industry just like maybe be in, in athletics in some respects sometimes the personality and the talent needs to marry right you need to be able to promote yourself and obviously have the talent to kind of match the the how you know the the talk that you're putting out there like a mayweather for instance right you you know you can't talk all the shit mayweather does if you're not actually good at boxing you need to be able to match that in some regard but you can't just be silent not saying a jack shit ufc we see it in the most part right the biggest the people that get the best fights are the ones that are able to sell the fights right are able to create a bit of controversy are able to kind of you know call out an opponent are able to kind of use the media for to you know in their for their advantage you have to be able to do that in, that in this day and age it is part and parcel of it in the same way if you're a designer you have to be able to understand a bit of marketing has to be understand a bit of sales a bit of merchandising you have to understand all these parts in order to kind of make your brand successful no or or you know um kind of you know uh, buddy up with somebody who understands that but there has to be an acknowledgement of that so sammy ross's collection i thought was fairly good again built upon what the what i kind of saw in the previous collection but again like i mentioned i'm a bit hesitant to say but i would i would i would hope in the further collections coming up that he'd kind of refrain from the performance side of it i think maybe it's getting a little maybe so it's again something the second time and they've only ramped up their production recently again um they haven't been doing runway shows for that long but i sometimes feel sometimes the performance side of it is taken away from it and again it's it's trying to over over intellectualize something that could maybe just be explained by just the the clothes themselves there doesn't need to be so many theatrics behind it that's just me in my point in my point of view but in terms of the clothes themselves i'm a fan of it like i've always said i i like what he does i think it's very interesting um i'll get some of the looks up here on the screen so you can check it out so it's a cold war 4 and again the casting's always cool this is just london though. it's just standard london i think everyone else kind of needs to kind of react to this and kind of make a big song and dance about including people of um, different races and creeds and body shapes and sexuality but i think london is just part of our dna we just this is what we this is what we do for the most part i just you know what i mean this is not something we kind of like fly our, our banner about but it's cool to see you regardless so um casting is great 
clothes look awesome nice accessories they've really ramped up on the accessories you can tell they've got some money behind them because they're having to kind of you know meet different business um ob obligations but the the the, um, the accessories range the bags range has really been ramped up a lot and obviously that might tie in with the fact that he's kind of making up i think i saw a capture collection of italian bags made or something i saw on hypebeast the other day but i love all of it i love these kind of Obviously, there's loads of jackets with loads of kind of... Mo I wouldn't say they're modular, but loads of pockets all over the chest of it. It kind of reminds me again... I think I remember seeing an old um, head porter. I think it might have been a tactical vest or a jacket. Collect I remember there was a collection. I think Hiroshi Fujiwara might have designed where it had all the tiny pockets all over it. Like, was done really, really well. It, was, it kind of gave me a little bit of goosebumps because it kind of made my, my skin crawl a little bit, all the little tiny pockets. But it was quite cool to see. And they've kind of taken that idea and kind of built upon it. Again, um, nice trousers. I like the shoes here. So I think he's taken a, a cue on the stuff that he probably wears and sort of made his own sort of Stan Smith um, kind of like thin canvas shoe for the most well thin kind of low top he's made for the most part that's building upon nike collaboration which i really like um again loads of nice vests that they're doing um loads of nice color blocking um nice details and all that malarkey and again like i said it does exactly what it says in the tin for the most part i think a cold war is probably one of the you know i don't i don't sure how he wanted to class himself if it was avant-garde or if it was modern contemporary whatever it may be but in that kind of realm wherever it may be it's probably one of the most wearable things out there it's easily be tied into stuff that you already have in your wardrobe um nice little details in it uh, mix it up really well like this suiting is incredibly nice i love this hopefully you see him sammy ross wearing some of this in real life too because he is banging out that icy miyaki uh pleated um outfit that a lot of people are kind of wearing with the pants and the suits but it'd be nice to see him kind of wear his own gear um every day for like everyday wear for instance so, like this is a nice i really like the tone on this suit as well and how it's how the proportions are sort of like fucked up with again really cool and again loads of loads of bags um loads of nice little big again loads of performance kind of re pieces here as well which is interesting um yeah so all in all a very nice collection I kind of like this all over, but I'm not sure who's on. I'm not sure who's spray painted on here. It might be, might be, it might be a kid or something that might have been stabbed. I'm not sure, but I love this hoodie underneath. I probably would have liked to have seen a lot more of this all over print. It reminds me again a lot of like of undercover. Maybe this whole kind of look could be a lot of like old school undercover, um, in terms of the look, in terms of even the piping on the trousers and stuff. But again, I, I'm a big fan of it. I think it all looks incredible. I like I liked how slow the models were walking during the runway. They'd walk really, really slow, kind of take a look back and then continue walking again. Might tie it in again with the two rivers on either side, with the creatures in the water. I don't know, you know, looking back on where you came from, how far you've come, blah, blah, blah. You know, people trying to pull you back. I don't know. There's some there's something in there to be said for it. But overall, lo love the collection. Um, this, jack, this coat looks super cool. It's a long coat here that they always do. These little spray paint details. I'm a big fan of raw edges. Or raw seams as well, super fat, and I love this as well. I'm not sure if they've done. I think they've done it with the hood, and not not with the hat. But I've liked this, so it's sort of like the the hat hood that they usually do a cold war. Um, I think I saw it in a in an actual like as a snapback. Did I see that in the collection or my bugging? I'm not too sure, but I remember seeing it. And again, they've um, updated the colorways on the Nike collaboration they did recently. So we're going to see a few more of those coming out. I think maybe towards the middle of the year, I'd assume. I'd assume. So I think there's red. I think there's this colorway here, which is kind of white and gray. And I think there's another grayish colorway too coming as well, which looks interesting. So overall, great collection. I'm a big fan of what Sammy Ross does in a uh, Cold War overall. Um, I think the styling as well is pretty interesting and done in a pretty good way. I think that's all getting all done in-house too, but in-house team. And yeah, all in all, a great collection. Uh, something that's really underrated, I think, on a Cold War is their scarves. They do really fucking cool scarves. Oh, look, it comes in all black too. Nike Liberation, that's nice. They do really, really nice, comfy scarves. And I'm not sure what, what material they're made of. I'm not sure if they're on 10% wool. Um, I'm not sure if they're cashmere, but this, uh, the scarves are really, really nice. You know, I haven't seen, actually, which I think they might have discontinued. Um, or maybe they're, make, they're moving away from. Uh, the, the sort of side bags. Yeah, or the roadman bags people call them. I've not seen them. I've not seen them in this collection at all. Okay, maybe they're moving away from them overall. Okay, no, we have one here, but they're not. They don't have the ones that they usually did back in the day. But yeah, um, so scarves are really nice, and of course, Sam Rose coming here at the at the at the end with his uh with his newborn daughter, which is nice to see. 
So yeah, again, I think this representation overall on the runway is just nice. I think overall for kids, not nice, it's more than nice. It's super inspirational. So I think for all the criticisms you might get for the theatrics or the collections, or sometimes it's a bit samey, or there's not much. In, I don't know, whatever it may be, whatever criticism might be out there, I think just what it represents for young kids out there trying to make it in the scene, I think is very, very, it's very important, especially considering the plethora of fucking kids who are just, you know, um, uh, what you call it? scooping up and hoovering consuming all these bullshit brands when they could be doing so much more themselves by getting involved whether it's making zines starting their own agency you know making their own making their own fashion brand they could be getting involved so easily themselves so it's good to see somebody like Samuel Ross kind of out there on the forefront showing the kids what is possible if if you decide to bet on yourself and take a fucking chance so yes I thought that was really nice Samuel Ross at a cold war for winter collection Round up a few more bits I thought were nice. Uh, Kotweiler was pretty decent too, but they're always consistently solid um, um, fixture in the London uh, Fashion Week, well, London Men's Fashion Week uh, lineup. Usually always do like a good job of kind of, you know, um, that sort of chavy tracksuit look. Um, is it is chavy allowed? You have to say chavy anymore? I'm not too sure. But whatever that look is, they, they've kind of honed it down really, really well. I know someone has actually got a couple of track pants from them and they always kind of swear by them that they fit amazing. So they're always a big fan of uh, Kotweiler. So again, I love the electric blue or cobalt blue, whatever you call it. I've seen a lot of that this season, actually, um, debuted on the runways. I think I saw a couple of pieces from a Cold War using the same color and maybe a few other collections too that I saw the other day. So maybe that is another full trend happening for full we're seeing a lot of uh snapback or bill hats for instance for the most part a lot of high water trousers so a lot of trousers kind of ending just just above the ankle i love these pants here actually they look really nice and again just a i'm just a big fan of um, a cold um cotweiler in general these trousers too with the these zips all over the front of them they look really nice but again uh cotweiler did an, had an absolutely barnstorming collection too big fan so if you like that, I recommend you check that out as well. There they are, the Cottweiler boys. Um, and then um, what else did I like that I thought was cool here? Um, we've got John Alexander Skelton. This is a quite interesting collection that they showed, I think, in a pub somewhere in London. Um, the models were all street cars. It looked like, for the most part, a very eclectic range of models. Um, who I assume would be, you know, working in different kind of industries, maybe a couple of authors, a couple of musicians involved in there somewhere, maybe some artists. And they were walking around this pub in, in London. And I think what I've, from what I've heard, the pub was quite dimly lit with candles on the table and the kind of uh, models were kind of interacting without interacting, kind of like a weird sort of like, you know, a theatre act sort of thing they were kind of interacting with people stashing people's phones out of their hands uh, <laughs> whispering stuff into their ear which was quite interesting so yeah um i thought that was quite nice the performative the performative element of the show overall looked quite interesting so i'll get up on here on the screen so you guys can see there it is so this is john alexander skeleton collection for winter so again loads of nice um dandyish looks loads of plaids it kind of reminds me of Vivian Westwood in that respect but again just more tied into the kind of London landscape for the most part of it you're definitely lucky to see a few of these kind of um, older dads walking around Mayfair and stuff you know we live in there all the time drinking Guinness at 2 p.m in the afternoon so uh, that's quite cool to see um, yeah overall a, a pretty solid collection I like the shoes here I like these trousers if looks on this guy um, yeah so fairly interesting if you're into that kind of look overall so I like that. I thought that was pretty nice from John, John Alexander Skelton that available there in London. I quite like this look actually as well with the scarf tied around, um, tied around the long hair draping down, which looks quite cool. Um, and then uh, what else I saw that was quite interesting. Um, Chalayan again, I think I mentioned this previously, didn't I? I think I mentioned it here before. Chalayan I thought was fairly interesting with the Wellington boots as well. I thought that was a fairly solid collection there. And then, last but not least, uh, Pear Gottesen. Someone I've only kind of discovered a lot the last couple of seasons so far. But I thought this collection was fairly, fairly solid as well. Something I've not heard a lot of people talk about, actually, on the interwebs. So I've been browsing. But I thought this collection by Pear Gottesen was really, really nice. Um, loads of, again, loads of great boots. Everyone's smashing the boots. I'm not sure if they're Caterpillar collaborations, but I thought these look just really good with the looks all above. Again, I'd wear the hell out of this outfit overall. Nice. Again, loads. 
I think everyone just, again maybe the performance art piece in terms of the, a cold war maybe take that back it just everyone in London has something it's just theatrics isn't it? that's what that's what we are I think Charles Jeffrey did the same sort of thing his collection had people in his I think in a bathtub or something like throwing confetti or stuff around so maybe it's just part and parcel of London's landscape so maybe Samuel shouldn't listen to me anyway regardless continue doing what you're doing but um, I thought this was a pretty cool collection <laughs> Of Robert Pierre got some loads of interesting looks, loads of interesting nice shapes. I love a I love some of this uh, skin bearing stuff, you know, three quarter length um, or you know shirts and stuff, showing off a bit of the abdomen and whatever it may be. Loads of nice suitings here as well. Loads of great nice little double breasted um, suit jackets, which are making a big big comeback the last couple of seasons. Interesting scarf there. I love these looks. There's been a few of these looks, isn't it? With the really tight, long sleeve, nice black jeans and boots. I think this has been something I've seen quite a lot, iterated in a lot of collections. That kind of look overall has been something really nice. I like it because it's very masculine. It kind of, you know, you can show off the kind of athletic form that you do have, you know, with the shoulders, sort of like your own neck on the on the neck hole there. I think overall there's some interesting ways you can interpret that look, but I'm a big fan of it. Again, more details with the crop looks more um massive wide shoulder suit jackets again which i'm a real big fan of and again i just love i just love the overall nice details i love this little pocket warmer here nice boot details again there i thought it was nice with the yellow i think there, there might be caterpillars isn't it, right they look a little bit like caterpillars and again last couple of looks here and there's a designer here himself so overall great collections i think i think everyone in london sort of like you know um gave themselves a nice pat on the back. Everyone did a good job for the most part. And I'm eager to see what's everyone going to show in Paris coming up. It's going to be another barnstorming collection in Paris, isn't it? Coming up in the next couple of days. Milan's usually something to kind of, you know, ditch and not really pay attention to. It'll be interesting to see, though, who walks the DNG walk, catwalk after the whole um, runway, after the whole debacle in China. You just see some of these social media activists who always get given, um, you know, always, always kind of get flown down to Milan to wear the stuff. I wonder if they're going to take a stance and not walk the runway show in Milan about all the kind of backlash has happened but you know i i am assuming probably not i'm assuming they probably won't give a flying fuck um but yeah that is it and off to milan and in paris so that's my fashion week roundup done for the most part let's flick into some topics i had here listed what do i have here <laughs> ba, 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 ba. fat shaming the last taboo <laughs> Let's see here. Let's get this screen down so I can watch this long. So, um, I saw this video article on the BBC. Thought this was fairly interesting. So it's about fat shaming. I'm gonna try and be as sensitive as I can regarding the subject because you know I have some skin in the game with it too. But yeah, let's watch the video. Listen to a few of the bits. What's going on? I think some of it's annotated and some of it isn't. So if you're listening via the podcast. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll read aloud what I see on the screen, and for the stuff that isn't, you'll be able to hear it via the audio. So let's show that there. Fat shaming is this the last taboo? The article says uh, Na Nadia Ishak and Leander Lewis have been campaigning against the discrimination and stereotyping of people who are overweight. They say fat shaming is often thought to be acceptable because people believe being overweight is self-inflicted. This clip is from Five Live. Cool. Let's watch this and see what these young ladies have to say. Your, di your diabetes waiting to happen. You may be happy, but your kids won't be when you die of heart disease. You put strain on the NHS. You're glorifying obesity and I don't want my girls thinking that's okay. These are just some of the comments Leander has received about her weight. <laughs> Leander and Nadia want to challenge the stigma associated with obesity. I volunteer at major associations, major companies who I have to wear a uniform. Oh the, the, oh, the uniform. And I pre-warn them, I email them, I tell them, you have to do that, and I say, I say, please, you need to cater for me. This is the size, this is this, this is that. Yes, yes, yes. I get there and I'm humiliated yeah. in front of other people, yeah. trying on a t-shirt that doesn't even fit over my chest. People find it okay to, to be able to comment down. But that's weird, right? So the first bit is already strange because she's complaining, you know. I just think, hmm. There has to be an acknowledgement, right? That there is, that there can be outliers, right? Outliers do exist, right? So if, for instance, if you know, if you took a, a huge population of people, sort of people, and you said that, okay, generally everyone was this size, but generally there are people that are underweight, people that are overweight, those outliers have to be responsible 
for ensuring that wherever they, they are, that's probably a bad way to pause it because the eyes are a bit fucked up. But whoever they have to, it's your responsibility, isn't it? If you're a bigger person, to let someone know that maybe you need to be accommodated for, right? And I, I get her, I get her uh, bother. I get it, right? You're, you're having to wear a uniform, and uniforms, even for someone that isn't fat, are always annoying. Especially when I used to work at Game. Remember when I used to work at Game? I used to have to wear that, pick that purple polo that they used to give you. And it never fit right. Sometimes the, the shirt that you get would say it was a large, but it was a, it was a large four years ago when some other guy wore it and they've washed it a million times. They've uh, put it in the tumble dryer that shrunk it a little bit. So by the time you get it, it's super tight. Your fucking man boobs are sticking out. You feel super awkward. You hate the fucking job anyway because it's paying minimum wage. It's annoying. I think even for people that are not overweight, I don't think you've ever, have you ever walked into a shop and seen someone wearing a store uniform and thought, oh yeah, that fits right. It's always fit clunky, right? They've, they're always, uh, especially even guys when they were, were, were work in shops um, that have to wear uniform. The trousers always look like fucking, you know, jogging bottoms. They're so big. They're all shiny because they've, they've ironed them over and over again a million times. They don't want to buy another pair of trousers because they don't want to invest any sort of money into a job that they hate. So if, in, in general, no one looks good in uniforms. Uniforms are always, uniforms are always, um, what they always feel a bit, you know, claustrophobic and clumsy and it just doesn't look good. So I think if you're someone that's a bit bigger and you have to kind of, you know, ask for special treatment about um, the clothes that you want to, or special, can, no, you want you want to be given clothes that fit you and you want to know the, let the people know ahead of time, hey, these are my needs, and you get there and it doesn't happen, cool, that's annoying, but I don't think you can attribute that. It's not totally the fault of the company. I think just sometimes outlier, especially when you're, I don't know, I don't know what sizes these women are in terms of whatever size women are, plus 16, whatever you might be, it just, you know, not many people are going to be making clothes that are going to fit you exactly. Even in even in the high street stores that cater towards fashion, let alone in uniforms. I think it might be a little bit, you know, it might be a little bit out of order to think that a, a, your workplace is going to get it completely right. Even H&M doesn't get it right when they, you know, they might wrongly label or they might say it's a 16, but it might not be a 16 to you. Right. Do you know what I mean? So I don't know. That's something I'm not that really sold on. But let's continue the video and what, see what more they have to say. Directly to me about my size and how they think it is as opposed to if somebody else you know they wouldn't they wouldn't go up to somebody else and say oh you have you're an alcoholic or anything like that but they feel quite happily that they can straight up to me and say oh you're you, you're so fat and so i think for me one of the most i'm not sure that happens i'm not sure i'm not sure the anecdotal evidence like that is true i'm not sure there's many people out there that are gonna go up to a fat person and say oh my god you're so fucking fat <laughs> that's mad that's super mean i don't think anyone's really gonna do that and i think me being as a former fatty I never really got people coming up to me saying stuff like that. You might have got indirect statements, right? So one of my stories when I was a former fatty that happened to me was I was in Uniqlo. And I think this is when Uniqlo kind of first maybe launched the first five or so years they launched. Everyone was kind of going there to get their gear because it was very, very... Now it's not so much. It's kind of skewed a bit European in terms of the clothes that they kind of put in the shops and stuff. But when they first launched, it being a Japanese brand and me being an addict of like Japanese streetwear, you used to get a lot of great stuff from there, right? With selfish jeans, whether it was uh, great jackets or it was great body warmers. And loads of it had nods to old kind of stuff that you might have seen from Japanese brands from yesteryear, right? So it would be a good place to kind of go to and kind of cheat and kind of, um, kind of like, you know, um, pad up your wardrobe a bit. But obviously me being a bigger dude back then, I think I might have been about 260 pounds, um, so I was quite a fat dude. I maybe like a size 38 waist. And I remember I was eagerly trying to get a pair of selfish denims when my kind of hundred jeans were kind of dying a slow death. And I asked one of the store sisters to kind of help me out, get a bigger size. And she kind of said something kind of throwaway, like, oh, sorry, but this style doesn't, it doesn't, this is the size it comes in. And it's not going to get any bigger than this, right? It's not going to fit you any bigger. Because I think there wasn't any, I think it was the 36 and 38 weren't that, there wasn't much difference. And I think I kind of raised it up and she was like, oh, it's not our fault, innit? It's just like, maybe you're just, I think she insinuated that maybe you're just too big. And obviously, I've, and obviously at that time, when I'm, because obviously I've, I've, or, I've always had big thighs, right? I've always had really, mu let's, let's say muscular thighs, right? But when you get fat, that muscular thigh turns into just pure fat. So my, my waist might have been not that big, but my thigh in combination with my fucking ass makes it so that, jeans don't really fit me right because you know they might fit on the waist but they're not, not going to fit on the legs by the time we try and get them up so i was a bit distraught but again that public shaming that i received in the shop didn't make me change it didn't make me change my habits or maybe change the way i kind of live my life and i really didn't um and i really and again that was the only time someone publicly came up and said something to me everything else was kind of like 
insinuated or kind of said without saying right when you're like for instance like when you're when you're in the escalator and you're kind of walking up this game people are standing on the right hand side when you're a bigger guy everyone moves because you're coming up the stairs right you're you, like you're not moving people are moving out of the way because they don't want to be knocked over and you again it's an unbiased thing but you kind of feel that you kind of feel that shame when you're sitting in a train and you're already sitting down and people are kind of avoiding sitting next to you because they don't want to be cramped in with your fucking shoulders or your elbows kind of, you know, um, overlapping into a space. Or when you're about to sit down in a free space that's in between some chairs and people kind of squirm and get out of the way because you're going to overfill the room. Those of these things happen. But again, they don't change. They don't make you change your actions or your behaviors in terms of what got you to be fat overall. It's a decision that you have to make yourself. And that decision came much, much later on in my life when I was finally, you know, I was kind of getting around the scene. I was kind of becoming a bit popular. I kind of saw that I maybe had a personality that people might like and stuff, especially when it came to girls. But I was never kind of getting any girls, right? And I kind of discovered, hold on, I'm a much cooler dude than some of these guys that are getting these girls in the scene. Um, I think I'm not that bad looking. But the one thing that's kind of ruling me out against every other person out there in terms of, you know, if it's a mating game, one thing that's kind of really not um, helping me in my favor is the fact that I'm kind of obese, right? For my height and wherever I am, I'm overweight. I'm way, way overweight. So it's something that I can get into control because I can't really make myself buffer, right? For the most part, you can't make yourself look more attractive. The only thing that you can do changes maybe your clothes and your weight. But the amount of change that really happens when you change your diet, and you lose a couple of pounds and you maybe change what you wear to maybe suit your body shape or to maybe maybe suit your style or maybe you kind of hone your style in you can't it it, it doesn't need, it, you can't um i can't emphasize how much more attractive that makes you even if you don't have a personality for instance i'm, I'm lucky I, I do have a personality i'm quite outgoing right i'm not going to be a wallflower I, I am fairly confident to go up to people and talk to strangers and shit but even if you don't have a personality just changing your diet and getting into some shape and changing the clothes that you wear can suddenly make take you from a two to a six easily and going for two to six as a guy is a big big news right because that means it opens up this opens up the land in terms of who you can attract and again i'm only saying this for people that want to attract mates want to attract partners if you don't care about that stuff no problem but again i don't think ever in my life i've had someone come to you and point and say hey fatty it's always been indirect things that people have been saying and again i don't blame them because yes you are you're an outlier you have to admit that in a, in a pack train you are maybe one of five or six people that are generally of weight everyone else for the most part is within their ballpark with their weight estimate so it 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 doesn't it doesn't behoove people to say some things when you look much different than anyone else i don't i don't take it as an offense same way when i went to prague and i was walking around with the brunette um her being super pale and me being incredibly dark and walking down the streets of prague and people are staring at us i'm not going to be offended by it. i'm not going to be annoyed by it as long as they're not saying anything uh derogatory or riding i get it right not many people come around in their city who look like us it makes sense for them to stare it's no problem whatsoever anyway let's continue the video Interesting things is microaggressions. So I microaggressions. had a very thin ex sister in law say to me, You're so brave for bearing your arms. I'm like, it's summer, it's 150 degrees, like I'm not drinking, it's heavy. It's sort of that's not a microaggression though, someone saying that. I think the fact that her ex-sister-in-law, which I think, you know, she emphasized that, my ex-sister-in-law, so I know she's so happy that, that they're not together anymore. But um Whoever says that, right? My ex sister in law. So, like, what weird sentence? Someone once, just say someone said to me once, I remember. Why do you have to say, stipulate who it was? It's just, again, unnecessary details. But I think this ex sister in law, whoever, whoever that person is, she was a bit, you know, silly for saying you're brave. No, you're not brave for bearing your arms, right? You're brave for having to work in, you know, sub degree temperatures on a fucking crazy work site in the middle of summer. That might be brave. But I don't think brave is bearing your arms. That's a bit ridiculous. It might be. It might be, you know, there might be some courage above it because, you know, social taboos or social contracts might let you know that, you know, maybe you shouldn't be bearing your arms or maybe you feel embarrassed. Because, again, it's, it's all you, right? You're the one that feels embarrassed. Most people don't care because we know you're fat. And I, I never really got that. It's like when, if you're overweight, like, I used to do it myself. If I was overweight, when I was overweight, I used to, I used to only wear black t-shirts because I didn't want to wear white t-shirts because see the flub moving around. But people know you're fat. It's, you're not, you're not, no one's shocked. No one's, um. you're not fooling anyone by covering yourself with black clothing we all know you're big it's like it's like when fat people go in swimming pools and they don't take their shirts off i never got i never got that because you know i'd never go next walk and can't swim anyway but i never did that anyway i'll just take off my shirt why am i gonna not have my shirt off if i'm i know i'm fat we all know we all know everyone around me knows i'm fat too why am i gonna, I'm gonna cover myself with a shirt so that arm thing again is something that's it's more of your it's more of her problem as opposed to outside again people are gonna judge and might snicker and stuff and look oh my god look at the fat wobbling around but 
we know you're big. You know what I mean? After the first look, it kind of goes away. You know, no one's kind of registering or staring at you three or four times. There might be one or two looks here and there, but that is what it is, isn't it? It's like if you wear a crazy outfit. Like, are, are people going to come, are, you know, are we going to get fashionistas coming out now and saying, oh, I feel like it's my microaggression when people say to me, I'm so brave for wearing this, like, um, caterpillar or this cheetah print suit. No, you're a fashionista. You have to accept that what you're wearing is not something that's in the norm. People don't usually go out dressed head to toe in all green. So people are going to look at you and think, oh, that's quite weird. I don't usually see that. But again, it's your prerogative, right? But it's not, it's not the, it's not supposed to be for everyone else to kind of suddenly change the way they kind of look at people just to make you comfortable. You have to understand that you look the way you look and that's going to garner some looks and attention, but it's up to you to kind of set the standard and be like, you know what? Fuck it. I don't care. I'm putting my arms out there and that's it. And again, it is mostly her issue. It's not really a, I don't, I don't know if people care about... And again, maybe it's a woman thing too. I only hear women talk about, oh, my arms are really fat. I've never heard a guy say a girl's arms are fat. It's a woman thing. So it's other women judging other women, which is really interesting too in that regard. Um, the last continue. taboo that's left that they can still use. Taboo. In terms of, you know, the, usually with the sexism was that, hey, doll, and you're a babe, and come home with me. Now that's being toned down, but it's still now fully acceptable for somebody to, to call out in the street, oh, you, you fat girl, hey, can you, can you eat another pack of the chips or something? And that's seen as okay because I did this to myself. I just like so brave, I would never do that. But you have to kind of accept that there is something about, you know, I think in general... I don't think um, I'm not sure how good I'm not sure how constructive it is a society for us to finally get to because let's imagine we get to a point where everyone kind of accepts that being fat is a norm and you shouldn't be you shouldn't fat shame and it's not a thing anymore. Is that healthy for anyone? Like, shouldn't it be a thing where, you know, where sometimes you meet up with old school friends or old friends from that you used to go out with and you hear that one or two are being, uh, are doing some amazing things and really successful and you feel a bit envious, and you feel a bit jealous and you have that kind of tug in your heart that you're not doing shit and you go home and you write an action plan and you try and follow it and you try and change your things that you're doing and try and make some changes. That's a good thing, isn't it? It's a good thing to maybe have people in society who are maybe doing a bit better than you are so that when you speak to them, it reminds you that, oh, if he can do it, I can do it too. And it might be a good thing too so for, to live in a society where sometimes people can call you out on something that you can change. Because there are, again, there is rare, the rare occasions where there are people out there who do have conditions that make them more susceptible to gaining weight or make them, you know, it might be a, a DNA. We're learning now with advances in science that sometimes I remember listening to a Joe Rogan podcast or someone, I think it might be Dr. Rhonda Patrick said that there are studies out there that have shown that women who are overweight during their pregnancy but lose it before they give birth, their child's come up, their child, uh, their, their babies when they come out can be normal sized. But usually if you stay overweight even throughout your pregnancy and you give birth, overweight it's more likely your child's gonna be overweight fucking crazy right new studies out there have shown so there are there, it does happen right there are occasions where sometimes you know because you got fat mom you might be fat yourself it just those things can happen sometimes but i think it does we do need to live in a world where some people where you're able to be challenged on something that you can by and large change because for the most part i know for me like i put on muscle and i put on fat really easily if i go off my diet and i go crazy and i eat whatever i want to eat i'm gonna gain some pounds and at the time the point that i'm in now i've gone i don't know the best part of five or so years at kind of a normal let's say quote-unquote weight range i was kind of really obese or overweight back in the day a few years ago so i don't really have any more fat clothes left anymore so it would kind of be out it'll kind of be um in my uh it will kind of wouldn't serve me any good if i did gain all that weight back because i have to buy a new wardrobe to accommodate for the extra pounds i have so i kind of have to keep myself in this uh particular kind of bracket for the most part and that helps and in general i feel better anyway it's something that i enjoy to do it's something that's a bit challenging a bit of a struggle to do during the day but it kind of makes me get up in the morning and feel like i'm doing something it's a great it's amazing and that structure i need but i don't know how how good it would be for my life overall to kind of have that out of the have that have one side of my life where I can't control and then have other things in my life that I can control. I just don't think that would really suit me in that regard as a personality. But let's see the last bits of what they're saying here. Like, you're a size 10. Like, if you wouldn't do it, are you saying I definitely shouldn't do it? Because I'm, I'm not a size 10. So what am I... I'm not even allowed to wear a dress. And there are these ridiculous things that it seems, if you're a fat woman, you're not allowed to do. Um, that uh, not allowed to do thing again. I just think that's your own internal dialogue. I think when I when I was fat, I had a lot of things I told myself I wasn't allowed to do, but no one was telling me that. I just didn't do that. I remember even my mum when I was fat back in the day telling me not to wear shorts because my legs looked fucked. Right? 
and that's your mum doing that. Your mum's, you know, parents can sometimes say mean things to you or whatever, but that's people saying stuff to you in order to kind of for your best interest. They don't want you to be teased or whatever it may be in school. That's all fine. It's coming from a good place. But most of the things that I said to myself were were self-constructed. I was self-directing it to myself. They were my own insecurities. They weren't having any other people. No one was telling me I couldn't wear a white t-shirt. I was doing it because I didn't want people to know that I'm fat, even though they clearly could see that I'm fat. All these things are happening that I was kind of inflicting to myself. So again, I just think, with this whole fat shaming thing, there is a lack of personal responsibility. I get not being mean, right? I get it. I think if that story is true, that woman saying that she's walking in the street and people are yelling at her, hey, fatty, why don't you eat another pack of crisps? Well, I don't think it's true. It sounds a bit made up. But if it did happen, then I have sympathy for it. I think that's super mean. And the guy that did that is a fucking dickhead, right? Do you know what I mean? You shouldn't be doing that to anybody. But there is some personal responsibility that attached to it. You need to be responsible for your health and your weight and the things that you do. And you should also know that some things you can change. You can't change a lot of things in life. Some things in life are lock, stock, and loaded right there are as they are you come out of your womb your parents womb you can't choose your parents you can't choose your family sometimes you can't even choose your friends depending on what area you live in but something you can choose something you can change is your mind and your body right you can make sure that you cultivate a mind that's kind of resilient and strong and you can also take responsibility for how your body is right so one vessel that we have we only have one shot in life you know life expectancy uh, for the most part if you indulge in other things other vices slowly slowly but surely decreases why not live your life to the fullest as healthy as you can be that's it that's it that's the only question if you don't mind being fat and you don't mind being overweight that's cool but then what you can't do is then suddenly put all these um uh constraints on people in terms of how they act towards you that isn't fair either right if you take the decision to be fat you have to, have to expect accept the responsibility that comes with it it's like when people say about celebrities oh why are they complaining about that stuff this is, this is what you sign up for i don't agree with it but there is some sort of merit to it right if you just if you, if you decide to put yourself in the public eye and people chastise you people praise you and then they kind of turn turn back and start hating on you you have to take both sides of it you have to take the praise you have to take the negativity same if you're fat if you want to be accepted in society as being fat cool no problem but if you get teased for it you can't complain right if people, if people say why don't you lose weight you can't complain either because generally people are losing weight general people can lose the weight it's a, again it's a weird slippery slope i've been there i'm happy like i said being an ex fatty i kind of know that it's a very personal decision it's a personal very personal journey some of the things you kind of go through no one else can understand because it's only your things that you're going through your insecurities it's kind of there's loads of things that are happening in your head at the same time but i just think turning it into some activism thing, turning it into, you know, a microaggression, turning it into, um, I don't know, like you're the victim is a little bit weird, a little bit bizarre and something that I wouldn't necessarily encourage people to do. But again, what the fuck do I know? Anyway, what's next on the list here? Oh, female UFC fighter smashes a thief. This was a quite interesting story. So this, um, this Brazilian... This Brazilian MMA fighter um, was in Brazil and some, uh, what do you call it? Some pickpocket guy tried to jack her phone, I'm assuming, and unfortunately landed into the wrong person to jack the phone off. Like, imagine of all the places, imagine of all the people you could try and attempt to jack a phone off of. It's from a, you know, a, a current UFC fighter, right? A female at that too, who just absolutely smashed his face in. And yeah, the story is fucking <laughs> hilarious. So I'll read a little bit of it now. Um, on Saturday night around 8 p.m., uh, local time a man tried to steal UFC strawweight Pollyanna Viana's phone not only did she he leave into handed but also got a painful reminder of the mistake on Sunday Viana, kind of the events according to Viana she was waiting for an Uber in front of her apartment complex um, a neighborhood in the west zone of Rio de Janeiro when a man approached her he must have been sneaky Viana said because when she noticed his presence he already got got quite close when I saw when I saw when he saw I saw him he sat next to me he asked me the time I said it and he and I saw he wasn't going to leave. So I already moved to put my soul in my waist. And then he said, give me the phone. Don't try and react because I'm armed. Then he put his hand over a gun. But I realized it was too soft. He was really close to me. So I thought, if it's a gun, he won't have time to draw it. So I stood up, threw two punches in the kick. He fell down. And then I caught him in a rear naked choke. Fucking hell. Then I sat with him. Then I sat then I sat him down in some in the same in the place where we were and said, now we'll wait for the police. <laughs> so badass. Pollyanna, big up her, man. What's so fucking badass? There's something so calm and assuring, right? About not about learning um, martial arts or learning any sort of self-defense. That when you're in a when you're in a situation like that, life or death for the most part, right? Because most of you know average everyday folk if you're in a position where somebody's threatening you take your phone and they have what you think might be a gun right 
um, you're in fight or flight system, you might just want to give it over to kind of get out of this way of not kind of getting killed. But there is a sort of calmness, right? That kind of like resting heartbeat, right? You kind of breathe in and breathe out and just really assess the situation. You look at him, you look how close he is, you see the gun soft, you assess all these things she assessed. She thought, okay, why not? You can't draw the gun this close to me anyway. A uh, couple of punches, couple of kicks, rear naked choke is out. Like amazing, fucking amazing. And again, I remember, I remember, I remember that being a thing when I learned um, a bit of Muay Thai when I went for fucking four weeks and I did the when I did the group on uh, classes. That was part of Mona why I wanted to do it, right? That idea that I just wanted to be calm in situations. I didn't want to be. You know, I didn't want to turn into John Jones. That's not going to happen anyway, right? But I just wanted to be in a situation. I just wanted to be able to be calm. That's the thing I used to always see when I used to get into really tense situations or arguments in the street. I'd get really shouty and loud, and usually that was to overcompensate because of how scared I was. I had to convince myself, okay, you're not scared, fucking go for it. Do you know what I mean? You kind of do that sort of thing. But when you learn um, any sort of self defense in Muay Thai, where I learned in terms of getting punched in the face or getting kicked in the leg, what you start to realize is that the more calmer you are, the better you are at fighting. That is just what it is. The tense, you know, you've seen it in UFC, you've seen it in boxing. When people come into the ring and you already are, oh, this guy's going to lose. Why do you say that? Because you see how tense they are, right? They're biting down in their mouth guard. They're already, they're tightly wound up. Their shoulders are scrunched up. You know what I mean? They're putting their shoulders up towards their neck. They're not nice and loose. And when someone's nice and loose, they're always, always, more, more likely to not perform much better. So imagine everyday, everyday public in the street and some street robber cries and robbing what happens. And of course, the fucking effects of it were incredible as well to see. I think I've got, I might have a picture here actually. Of the guy's face and the end of it, which is super super funny as well. So yeah, so you got here. Um, obviously, the robber's face here on the right, and the lovely Pollyanna here on the on the left. Absolutely sparked him. That looks that looks a lot more. Like that that look. I, I know she's is a statement, but that looks a lot more than a couple of punches and a kick and a rear naked choke. That looks like she hit him with a fucking elbow, a couple of headbutts. Maybe he looks fucked up. But yeah, um, bad luck, man. Imagine that's when you know just have you have the worst luck. You go and jack someone's phone and you happen to bump into... Because, again, she doesn't look like a UFC fighter. Most women, look UFC fighters look quite, you know, um, what do you call it? Uh, they look quite aggressive and maybe manly, quote-unquote. But a lot of the newer generation UFC fighters that are coming in are very, very uh, feminine-looking, very attractive. You would have no idea they were, they were fucking UFC champions by just looking at them. You just think, oh, it's just a fairly... Um, a very attractive fit girl you wouldn't think she was you know she's gonna fucking throw elbows at your face and choke you out within five seconds but yeah fucking incredible but also lets you know that you know a, a, a fairly decent level ufc fighter will knock out most dudes one-on-one -on -one. that's quite scary to fucking figure out right most you know she's got i think what's her record like one and one she's a fight or something right yeah uh one-on-one -on -one ufc uh 10 and 2 mma so fairly decent um ufc record but a fairly decent ufc fighter woman right we've got any weight pick a weight you want would probably fuck up most dudes in a cage or fuck them up would fuck them up no time a couple of kicks a couple of elbows right kind of stay out of striking distance. especially if you're a bigger dude you might be able to smother her but if she stays outside of striking distance like she'd be able to fuck you the fuck up, which made it which made it even more funny when I saw that thing about Ellie Golden uh, challenging J uh, Jackmate to a fight. And obviously, you know, Jackmate, you know, he's just there ranting and raving on YouTube. He's never gonna accept it because imagine if he gets knocked out. Imagine Ellie Golden knocks you out. That is mad. And I'm, I'm assuming she's fairly. She probably she looks fairly fit. She's always sporting a fairly toned six pack. So I'd assume Ellie Golden might do a few a bit of Muay Thai or Taekwondo. She looks like that kind of girl. But yeah, um, I thought that was fairly funny. Um, Thief gets knocked out by an MMA fighter for trying to jack phone. Not in this place. Another thing. Um, oh, uh, male haircuts. Okay, this is on the back of seeing this haircut from Neymar, right? So Neymar's changed his hair again. And he's got fake dreads, which no one's really talking about. Uh, um, Neymar's got fake dreads, which looks fucking insane, right? Um, because obviously he didn't, you know, obviously they're fake because he didn't have dreads before. Dreads take a long time to grow. As you can see with my hair, when I look it up, it's still not going to be that long. And all of a sudden Neymar's got hair, looks like Bob, Bob Marley, right? Uh, let's see, Neymar dreadlocks, right? Dreadlocks. Let's see if someone got it up on here, a full picture of it. Because it looks fucking interesting as fuck, right? Um... <laughs> It's weird, isn't it? That it's not it's not like a taboo, this fake dreadlocks thing. So he's got like a mohawk with like fake dreadlocks on the back of it, right? I think I've got it up in here on the screen so you can see. So it's weird that it's not because I remember little little B's got it. Little B's the most famous one with having fake dreadlocks. He's got really long, kind of like future length dreadlocks, right? But Neymar just kind of like no one really bats an eyelid that he's got fake dreads. 
fake dreadlocks. Like they're not real. Like these are fake. Like he's just got them attached and they're just to kind of have a look. He kind of was a bit questionable with these ones, but you know, it looks a bit small and you can tell maybe the same haircut as his. But the one thing I do rate Neymar for is haircuts are always on point. That's something I want to talk about. Dreadlocks is one thing, don't get me wrong. I'm not really a fan of it, having fake dreadlocks in the most part. But one thing I do appreciate a lot about Neymar is his haircuts. He takes a lot of chances on haircuts and something that I've kind of think I, I wonder why men in general don't really like it it's a thing that's a bit tabooish in some respects this is his tweet from bleacher sports and it's got a lot of response in the comments but for the most part i don't know what it is about guys maybe it's in terms of sports in terms of football it being like a working class game it being something that a lot of poor people played back in the day in order to kind of rise themselves up from the from levels of poverty and maybe um the introductions of haircuts tattoos um different colored boots is kind of fancy and dandyish and kind of goes away from the kind of working class roots of um uh, football and the fact that it's not it's not very um it's not very inclusive of prima donnas, even though we love fucking, you know, the roly poly. Um, we love the dramatic nature of kind of prima donnas. But for the most part, football, the football culture tends to stray away from prima donnas, right? We like people to just get on with their job, right? And, you know, not much, not many personalities in football for the most part. It kind of, the media kind of drowns out of you because they twist, um, um, they, they twist and turn everything that you say. But one thing that I do appreciate Neymar for is the fact that he takes chances. He's fairly one of the best football players in the world, right? In terms of it, he's always in the, he, he, he doesn't stray away from taking a dive or taking a roll up roll up or two he's very unapologetic of the fact that the abuse he gets on the pitch and you know it is what it is i'm gonna make sure the referee sees the tackle that i got by rolling on the floor and he takes a lot of chances with his haircuts a lot a lot of time i know for my little brother he's he, neymar's an inspiration for him in terms of haircuts because he doesn't he takes chances one day it'll be long one day it'll be short one day he'll cut it one day it'll be curly another time he'll do that that front quiff at the front like sort of elvis i really like that i think that was just in the recent world cup um loads of kind of mohawk looks the fades are always really nice and now he's got this um sort of like weird dready dreadlock look that i'm not really a fan of personally but again taking chances um he's sort of like the black uh the black beckham in that regard didn't it? i really i really appreciate what he does with haircuts i think he does take a lot of chances but again i just think in general i don't know why people are not necessarily fans of taking chances but i guess the dreadlocks look this is just a bit too ridiculous imagine what, what the, the ribbon he must get in training when you turn up look what happens do, do, do people in change room start singing don't worry about a thing there's every little thing it's gonna be all right like it must be mad isn't it but i don't know it's very, very interesting very interesting haircut big fan of the neck tattoos i think they look fucking awesome but yeah neymar's an interesting character overall very interesting one of the rare players was all about the social media all about the the fancy nancy nature of it but performs all the time on the pitch right for the most part he never does not turn up in big games so he's one of the rare breed of football players out there who's able to kind of balance both worlds which is great to see but yeah neymar's got fake dreads for some reason and i don't know i don't know why but i kind of like them and i kind of don't like them i'm kind of in the middle i'm not too sure um <laughs> what's next on here uh, Spain to beat Japan in life expectancy. I thought that was fucking cool to read. Um, even though, so um, this is a, a report that came out recently, I think in October. I think I learned about it from listening to Christopher Ryan's podcast. Um, check it out. It's called Tangentially Speaking. One of my favorite podcasts is a guy that wrote the book Sex at Dawn, which is a very interesting pod, very interesting book for those that are interested in the kind of alternative uh, sex life out there. But um, Spain, this new report um, says uh, Spain to beat Japan in World Life Expectancy League table. So in terms of the average life expectancy, uh, Spain's going to finally beat Japan. And it's interesting because um, um, I read a bit of it. It's interesting. Well, it's interesting. I read a bit of it anyway, first of all, and I give my thoughts. So this is an article from The Guardian. It says here, people in Spain are predicted to, so it's here, there's a title of the article. So it says people in Spain are predicted to have the longest life expectancy in the world by 2020, by 2040, beating Japan in the second place. And much of the reason is to do with the way they, is the way they eat, according to the authors of the most comprehensive study. Uh, in the years to come, the biggest threats to our health and longevity will be obesity, high blood pressure and blood sugar, tobacco use and drinking alcohol, according to the Institute of Health and Metrics and Evaluation in Seattle. Spain does really well in those, said uh, Dr. Christopher Murray. Although tobacco is an, is an area where they could do better, but current life expectancy is very good. The Spanish who have expected to have an average lifespan of 85.8 85 years do particularly well in terms of diet, he said. Spain's health ministry funded uh, the study. Uh, Spain, uh, Japan, which has so, for so many years enjoyed a high place here in the planet, is set to lose its crown. Blah, blah, blah. Come on, let's see here. The data from the study continue updated with the research. For the first time, the team have produced a forecast. In my mind, the difference between better and worse. Um, 
out comes is the government. Where's a bit I saw that I thought was interesting? Come on, scroll down. The top 10 causes of death in the UK will be um, heart disease, Alzheimer's, lung cancer, lower respiratory infections, C COPD, uh, colon and rectum cancer, stroke, breast cancer, blah, blah, blah. The US Force of 20th. Murray said disappointed. Uh, duh. So I think basically the, what I was going to point out is that the, the, the interesting, I didn't mention the study, but the interesting part of why it's interesting why Spain outlives, why Spain has got high life expectancy in Japan, even though they smoke and drink a lot more than Japan, is that the way they, the way they do stuff, right? So everything is communal. They eat really late lunches. They eat really big, really big and late lunches, usually with friends outside somewhere. Everyone in Spain goes out to eat. Even if you don't have that much money, everyone goes to a local cafe or somewhere to eat because fairly, the food is fairly cheap. Um, and obviously, um, it's a lot more natural or organic than the stuff that we have. It's not not, not as many uh, chemicals and stuff involved in the, the food that you're eating. So it's a lot more nutrient-rich and nutrient-dense for the most part. So you get a lot more bang for your buck, for instance, if you're eating a salad as opposed to eating a salad here, blah, 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 blah. And just in general, so that kind of offsets the negatives uh, where they smoke and drink a lot more. Because when if you be in, if you're in Spain, one thing you will notice: people are puffing on cigarettes continuously. People are drinking in all hours of the day. You have people having, you know, cups of wine with their breakfast in the morning, or little little uh, glasses of, of beer, or is it eating a uh, a baguette or something for, for, for in in the afternoon? Like they drink and smoke a lot. But what they do do is everything is communal. You know, they hang around with friends and family. That obviously keeps you know making sure life is better. Because I. I'd assume living in a place like London, a place like New York, where you might live in a building where you have a hundred thousand people, a hundred people living in a building. Sorry, you might not. You might have only met three or four of them, right? And you're mostly spent your time mostly spent alone, not talking to people. And that's part of the reason why people stay alive longer, right? We are social creatures. We are social beings. We need to have that personal connection to kind of be alive. So it's no surprise that in a place like Spain, where everyone is kind of on that kind of gusp. You know, people lived longest for the most part. So I thought that was a fairly interesting um, article that I saw on The Guardian. Japan to beat, uh, Spain to beat Japan. And again, once the economy kind of gets back where it needs to be in Spain, everyone will sort of move back to those, everyone will move back to those places. Again, it might be difficult with uh, Brexit happening and whatever it may be. But I think overall, in terms of quality of life, like there's so many places out there outside of the UK. I've seen anyway. I'm a bit late to the party, I know, for that respect. But... You know, the more you travel, the more you realize some people are living it, have got it good, especially if you're if you're kind of low maintenance and you kind of enjoy the nicer things in life and you kind of want to live a life where you kind of have the ability to take your dog out to a park that hasn't you have to walk 75 minutes to walk to get to, you know, for the most part, there's loads of nice benches to sit outside and read a book and just hang out. Spain is a place to be for sure. In my opinion, what's next on here on the list here, blah, 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 what I have here again. Kevin Hart to consider hosting the Oscars. Okay, this was a very interesting topic because obviously we know the whole backlash that happened. So Kevin Hart um, was announced to, uh, announced to host the Oscars. I think the Oscars a few weeks ago, right? Maybe before the new year. Um, and then obviously, as per usual, with the whole um, um, mob mentality that exists on the internet as soon as it got announced that he was hosting it, people dug up old tweets of his where he was um, uh, doing fairly homophobic jokes. And um, and of course they dug those up again, but those same people didn't dig up his apology that he did during the time that it happened. And of course the tweets came out, public outrage ensued, and then um, uh, Kevin Hart decided to step down from the Oscars because he didn't want to apologize. He ended up he did end up apologizing in the end, but he ended up backing out of something that was his kind of long uh, um, long desired dream. And it kind of just seemed a little bit unfair, and the situation kind of seemed a little bit chaotic and it kind of seemed like we were kind of reaching that point now where people were starting to understand that maybe this mob mentality that we're having this social justice or this public shaming that we're having at the moment is kind of serving no ends and no means because there's you know people are not allowed to kind of just be forgiven for things you don't have to say sorry once you have to say sorry one two three four five six seven times how many times you have to say sorry before you can finally be allowed to kind of carry on with your life having to kind of revisit things in the past and of course um there's other things as well that added to the story that Kevin kind of explains in his interview that he did Ellen DeGeneres that really kind of resonated with me because things I've been thinking about a lot, especially after I read the book, um, So You've Been Publicly Shamed by Mark by John Ronson. Sorry, I recommend you check that out. But in this interview, he kind of explains a few things that happened to him during the kind of, you know, fallout with um with the Oscars on during Ellen, which I thought were fairly interesting. I'm going to finally kind of get up here. Uh, where is it? It's a video, right? Yeah, there we go. Let's get up here, kind of load, load, load. Um, he kind of basically mentions that what he didn't appreciate was the malicious nature of it, right? It was the fact that someone dug up these tweets not to get him out of the Oscars, 
but to end his entire career. And that's what it kind of feels like. It doesn't feel like people are kind of calling you to task and calling you out on your BS or calling you out on maybe being an ignorant at that time. It's, it feels like they want to end your career, right? That's that's the problem I have with the public shaming. I think um, that was an argument that I don't think Sam Harris articulated well. It, it, again, it doesn't, you know, I'm no, I'm no one to tell have, have Sam Harris to articulate anything. But Sam Harris had a lady on the podcast recently. I forgot her name, but she was really, it was a really good episode. One of my favorites, actually, who kind of spoke up in defense of kind of, you know, uh, social justice warriors and that kind of whole um, section of society. And she made some fairly good points, I thought, in a... It, in the most part, right? I, I kind of I kind of had a lot of sympathy for the stuff that she was talking about. But what I thought I was kind of lost in it was the fact that some of this public shaming that happens, it seems like they're doing it to just stop you completely. They don't wanna they don't want you to learn a lesson. Oh, don't the, the video's not loading her, they're loading up here finally. They don't want you to learn a lesson. They don't want you to grow. They want your career to completely end. They don't think you deserve the platform that you have, which is I think is a bit that's why I think is a bit self-serving and doesn't and no one kind of wins in that respect right because what then it seems as if like we are not allowed to make mistakes i'm not allowed to say something ignorantly back in the day which i don't have any kind of context to i don't really have any idea how it hurts a particular group of people and then once i finally get the education when someone from that group sits me down and tells me and calls me out my bullshit i should then be given the opportunity again to see if i'm going to do it again i think that's why people should be allowed to be hung by their own rope right it's, it, there's a saying right uh, you should give someone give them enough rope and they'll hang themselves right give forgive somebody if they do it again, then you're out, right? It's like, okay, I've told you now that this word that you said, right? I don't know if whether it's F word to describe somebody um, that's that's homosexual, whatever it may be, you might think it's funny, but somebody from that community might sit you down and say, hey, when I grew up, that word was very derogatory. That word was used to tease me, used to make me feel uh, lesser than. So they tell you, they let you know how it hurts some people. And then it's up to you what you do next. Are you going to use it again and fuck up things again? Or are you going to decide, you know what, of all the words in my vocabulary, I can take those words out if it means that I'm going to make, I'm going to make you feel better. Or if it means I'm not going to, I'm not going to cause you less stress. No problem. But I kind of thought um, what Kevin Hart kind of spoke about, I kind of agree with that. It kind of felt a bit malicious, right? So I kind of get the video up I here. Think it was, it I think it was right after I hosted the Oscars. So we went to dinner. Yes. Uh, and we talked about you hosting the Oscars, mm -hmm. that it was a dream of yours. You've always wanted to host the Oscars. I said you should host the Oscars. Mm -hmm. Then you get asked to, I mean, it must have been amazing when they asked you to host this year. I'm real. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of goals that I have on my board. I got a vision board, and on that vision board, there's so many things that I want to do that I'll check off as they get done. And Oscars was up there. Oscars was one of the highest of highs simply because... There hasn't been a lot of African-American comedians that have been able to do it. I would have been the fourth. So to get the moment, celebrate the moment. Oh my God, I can't believe it's happened. And then the next morning, after a day full of congratulations and celebrations, I'm hit with an onslaught on social media of my past coming back up again. Literally the next morning. Mm -hmm. uh, not even a full 24 hours to glow in the glory of Kevin Hart is hosting this year's Oscars. And when it happened, you know, my my first my first thought is I'm gonna ignore it. I'm gonna ignore it because it's ten years old. This is stuff I've addressed. I've I've talked about this. This isn't new. I've addressed it. I've apologized for it. I'm not gonna pay it any mind. Cause if you feed into that stuff, you only add more fuel to the fire. Right. I I'm not gonna do, I'm gonna leave it alone. Now the day goes by, the fuel is now, it's growing, this, this fire's angry. It's all over the place. Now the headlines are starting to change. The headlines are Kevin Hart refuses to apologize for homophobic tweets from the past. The word again was left out. Everybody took those headlines and started to run with it. So now- And that's, and that's probably the expert part of, um public outrage right it's not that it's not that they're able to kind of tear you down it's that they're consistently able to kind of make you bend at the knee that's the thing that's a little bit disconcerting because again you know you say you said a crazy thing back in the day you apologize for it for it then you don't feel like apologizing for it again because you've done it the first time right sometimes i remember even my parents said to me like when you say sorry too often the sorry you know it, it loses any sort of any sort of power right it loses its meaning it loses its gravitas when you apologize profusely uh, about something that you've done before or for a mistake you're doing again and again then how come how, how can i um take your how can how can your sorry have any sort of weight how can your apology have any sort of weight towards it so maybe i'm of that same sort of thinking and 
But instead, if you keep quiet and you don't apologize again because you feel like you've already apologized, the the public outrage mob are able to kind of continually ramp up the pressure and change the narrative and now make it seem like you'd refuse to apologize because you have some you have you have an unconscious bias against homophobic people. I mean or against homosexual people, against people that live that LGBTQ lifestyle, whatever it may be in that in that regard. It's insane. It's insane. And there's no winning. Because now it's like it's like they've given you a window to bend at the knee. If you don't bend at the knee in that window to keep your job, then it's all better off. But then as a guy or as a person, as a human being, why should you? Why should anyone have the right, or how should anyone have the um, authority to tell you when you should apologize for something, or this is that? Like, no, I should be able to look at what I've done, take on your, take on your, take on your suggestions, take on whatever you have to say, and make my own informed decision as a grown adult. And if you don't accept what I have to say, then fair be it. But you shouldn't be the judge and jury in order to, in order to make sure that I don't get anything again in life. That's ridiculous. Anyway, let's keep on continue. The slander on my name is all homophobia now i'm a little upset i'm a little upset because i know who i am i know i don't have a homophobic bone in my body i know that i've addressed it i know that i've apologized i know that within my apologies i've taken 10 years to put my apology to work i yet to go back to that version of the immature comedian that once was i've moved on i'm a grown man i'm cultured I'm manufactured. I'm, I'm a guy that understands now. I look at life through a different lens, and because of that, I live it a different way. So now, I'm kind of upset because these 10 years are just being ignored. They're being brushed past. Nobody is saying, guys, this is, this is 10 years. No headlines are saying 10 years ago, he apologized. Nobody's finding the apologies. Nobody's finding the footage from where I had to address it. I had to address it when I did Get Hard promo with Will Ferrell because of my joke that I had about my son. I had to address those tweets in 2012 in a very, very heavy, uh, heavy junket where I was asked questions and asked questions about homophobia based on those tweets. And I had to address it and apologize and say I understand what those words do and how they hurt. I understand why people would be upset, which is why I made the choice to not use them anymore. I don't joke like that anymore because that was wrong. That was a guy that was just looking for laughs and that was stupid. So imagine, you apologize for it at the time, right? And it's just, that's the thing. People find the tweets, they find the evidence that they want to tear you down. You apologize. You apologize at the time it happened, but then people don't want to find the apology. That's the very bizarre way of thinking about it. And then the Oscars obviously were finding it hard to find someone. And you can't blame them for finding it hard. Who who else wants to step into a firing line? Because it feels like if you step up and say, I want to host it, what else are they going to dig up to you in terms of your evidence? But there has to be said, is there probably a thinking out there of if you're, maybe not because the internet archive is this, right? So you can maybe get a cachet of all the tweets that you've read, you put out there. But there is maybe a suggestion, there must be, out, there must be a service out there. A, a, a kind of hush-hush consultancy service that kind of, you know, aims towards public figures that aims to kind of come through your social media, find kind of, um, what you would call it, find keywords, trigger words, right, that might be, you know, a little bit um, problematic and erase them from your account. They must be exist now because it's got to a point now where Kevin Hart is in a for the push, fortunate position because I guess he's big enough of a celebrity. He just came back, I think, when that news broke. I think he was touring in Australia and New Zealand and selling out fucking arenas, right? He's in a position where he can sort of, Inoculize, immu inoculize himself a little bit, I guess, personally, um, from the outrage that happens in the society and public in terms of what he does, in terms of you know stuff he says in the past. He can maybe avoid some of the pitfalls of other people because you can, you know, you can, you have a can have a successful stand up career in that regard. But I guess the machine he's built around him, he's feeding other people in other arenas, whether it's his film or production company, who are gonna get hurt if this kind of narrative continues that he's supposedly meant to be someone who has a problem against uh, people that are homosexual. So. He, he has a responsibility to his employees to fight this good fight. But I guess in this position, he can fight it because, you know, he's got someone, you, he's, got, he's, got, he's got enough money in the bank to kind of fight and enough kind of good reputation in the last 10 years in order to kind of, or graces to kind of have the benefit of the doubt. But if you're the average everyday person, you've got one of those big gigs and it gets pulled away from you, what happens then? We still happen to Rachel Dozo, right? That's a completely different topic, but we still happen to her. She's struggling. And you watch the documentary of her on Netflix. She's struggling just to kind of, you know, just to get any kind of job. Right, immediately, whenever 
she applies for a role. You see, a, you see video of something where she's got interviews. Whenever she applies for a role, and they find out she's going to do a quick Google because most places do that nowadays. When they when you send an application, they Google your name and shit. They see all the articles, and they don't want anything to do it because they don't want any sort of trouble. They don't want any sort of hassle. So. You know, there's two ends to it, but I completely understand Kevin's cast kind of frustration towards it. Like I said, it just seems vindictive. It doesn't seem like they want you to change, want you to learn a lesson or teach other people. It just seems that they want to end your career. And that's the thing that I'm not really a fan of. I don't do that anymore. So to be put in a position where I was given an ultimatum, I was given an ultimatum, Kevin, apologize or we're going to have to find another host. When I was given that ultimatum, this is now, it's now becoming like a cloud. What was once the brightest star and brightest light ever just got real dark. The Oscars is no longer about Kevin Hart stepping on that stage and taking a intense night where people are so uptight and making it loose and fun. That's my reason for doing it. I'm going to bring fun to the Oscars. I'm going to make the Oscars fun. Exactly. Now all of a sudden, it's a little darker. Because the conversation is about me hosting the Oscars. Conversation is about Kevin Hart's tweets from 10 years ago and homophobia. I don't want to step on that stage and make that night about me and my past when you got people that have worked hard to step on that stage for the first time and receive an award. I'm now taking away from all those moments because the night is, is focused on something else now. That's how I see it. Because I saw it like that, I said I would much rather step down and apologize again while stepping down. <laughs> again. Once again, I'm sorry if these words hurt. I'm sorry. But either my apology is accepted or it isn't. Either I can move forward or I can't. And that's the question for the public shamers. What is what 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 um what delineates moving forward? What is an acceptable amount of time someone could be in a doghouse? How many apologies is enough? What needs to be, what actions do you need to see? Because, you know, let's imagine, let's imagine he was homophobic back then. Let's imagine that, that those tweets came from a mean place. Okay, now he learns that maybe it's not good to have that kind of point of view. Now he has some perspective. He travels the world. He meets people from different sort of racial, ethnic, um, whatever sexual orientation backgrounds. And he kind of gets a bit more awoke. Um, he maybe gets a bit more woke, right? He, he realizes maybe his place in society, the platform that he has, all those kind of buzzwords. Cool. And he changes now. What next? Is it not sincere enough? Do you not believe him? Like, what next? That's the issue that happens now with this whole public shaming. The, the evolution is going to be of this. Because like, because for the public shamers, I think I kind of have sympathy for it in some respect because I think too long people were able to get away with saying whatever they wanted to say and hide behind their power or, you know, say it from a vantage point of being up in the clouds and no one can touch them, right? And it felt as if sometimes there were different rules for everyday folk and celebrities. I get that in some respects. I understand sometimes that can be a source of annoyance, even though I think sometimes you should just focus on your own life, right? You have a lot of things to do with than worrying about what sort of retribution is happening to a celebrity. But I get it in that respect to the bigger picture. So we're now in a position where sometimes some things, you know, you can't arrest him because he said some homophobic jokes or whatever. You can't put him in prison for it. But if you can do one thing, you can maybe publicly embarrass him for some regard, right? You can maybe take let, let him take stock and reflect on it and maybe think, you know what, that's, that, might, that might have been a bad thing to do, right? There's stuff that we do out there. People can maybe um, illustrate their discontent out of things, right? And companies can know things can happen, like dislike buttons and all those comment sections. These are important in terms of, you know, articulating how you feel about something. But then what happens next? What happens next? Now you've got it. What happens next? What's the, where's the road to redemption? Like any great story. That's why we watch some of the best movies in our, even, I don't know, um, The Dark Knight Returns, right? The fact that he went into that hole, has to dig himself out, right? What happens then? What's the redemption story? We all like it. We all like to, everyone likes to build up their stars. And people, say into, people say nowadays, celebrity, people like to build them up and tear them back down again. But why do people like to tear them back down? Because they want to see the ascension. They want to see if you're for real. And if you ascend again for the second time, then, they, then they're your fans for life. So what happens to that narrative? Where is that narrative now? Don't you want to see them turn around, turn it around? Or do you want to see them ascend again to the lofty heights that you once saw them before? That's amazing, right? That's, a, that's what you want. But I guess it's not the fact at the end of it. But he mentioned something else, I think, in the second clip that I'm going to quickly play. Um, Everything that you just said, I just have to say this. Um, about ending his career. I think she, Ellen's basically fighting for him. Today, I, I really want it a bit more here. Asking. What did it say? 
Come on. We're going to get to see. Mm -hmm. We're going to get to see on stage with you hosting the Oscars. Don't pay attention. So I think you mentioned somewhere around here. What? Let's see. The second what response. I, what I can say is this. I can say that there's a there's a flip side. Okay. The the flip side is to to any attack. You know, there's there's just another there's another side. There's a there's a there's a B side. There's always an A side. There's a B side. On my side, openly, openly, I say I'm wrong for my past words. I, I say it. I said it. I understand that. I know that. My kids know when their dad messes up, I'm in front of it because I want to be an example so they know what to do. In this case, it's tough for me because it was an attack. This wasn't an accident. This wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't a coincidence that the day after I received the job that tweets just somehow manifested from 2008. Now, I don't know who follows me or who doesn't. I'm on social media every day. I got over 40,000 tweets. To go through 40,000 tweets to get back to 2008, that's an attack. Exactly, and that's that's, that's and that's where again that's where I don't have any sympathy. That's why I don't. That's where I have sympathy for celebrities in that regard. Fair enough. I I did a doo doo. I did an oopsie, as PewDiePie would say. But let me let me at least redeem redeem myself, right? Don't just keep bringing up old things again and again. And the absolute losers, the absolute losers that are combing through celebrities' tweets in order to find um uh, disparaging comments, in order to kind of tear them down. Like how sad is your life? And the person that did it, right? He's right here. I don't think he's tweeted since December. I found the original guy that tweeted it, right? And where is he? He's he's here. His name is what? Doesn't matter what his name is, was it? Ben Ben Fraser Lee. And he originally tweeted, he originally brought up these uh, tweets again. Um, I think he writes for The Guardian US. Right after it happened, so the 5th, 5th of December, so much happened on the 4th, he, he, he made these, he, these are the tweets that he put back out there again. And since then, he hasn't tweeted again. So that's the thing that, hey, is that personal responsibility? You want the celebrities to take responsibility for their actions, but then you don't take any responsibility for what you've caused either. You drop, you kind of drop the grenade and run out of the room, never to be seen ever again. Like it blew up the entire house and let Kevin's heart kind of career on the T. Because again, it needs to be said with how um, what you call it the moralities the, the the Hollywood's morality is always a bit skewed anyway, right? They're only as good as their last event or tweet or whatever. Again, everyone, right? That's that that's a problem. So if the public if the public sort of like um outcry is not in Kevin Hart's favor, his career is over. Like that's how that's why I'm signing his passion for it because. In an industry where you're having to seek approval from everyone in order to kind of watch your movies or to kind of come to your shows, if the public decides that they believe this guy's uh, tweets and his narrative, you are done. You're done completely. So it's kind of like a weird fight. You're fighting an the industry will just follow suit. They won't stand up for you. They won't say, oh, no, we know Kevin's a good guy. We're going to stand by him and keep funding his movies. We're going to keep giving him chances. No, they're, they're going to cave to public pressure and they're going to completely cave and get you out of here. And then you're never going to be seen, seen again. So this guy retweets or shares a comment that Kevin Hart did originally that went for it, right? So on the 5th of December, and he says, hey, I wonder when Kevin is going to start deleting all his old tweets, right? Benjamin Lee tweeting about this stuff. And then he wrote, and then he wrote, and I wrote about why Kevin's homophobia isn't welcome at this year's Oscars. So he continued to wrote about this stuff. And then look, he drops a bomb. And then since then, I don't think he's ever tweeted again since. Since then, he's not, not tweeted. So last time he tweeted, oh, he's come back again. It came true. He's come back. He's back again. After, after December of December, he completely disappeared. And now he's back again. Saying nothing. What a what a donkey! What a donkey! That's the that's the problem I have with it. Absolute losers that are around there fishing around people's mistakes and hoping that they fail. But again, I just don't think that because it's going to make you successful. You're not going to be any better for it. Fair enough. You tore him. You tore him down. You stopped his progress. You've denied him the chance of to host the Oscars, even if he doesn't go around and host host him again. What for you? What's it done for you? Or are you are you going to be uh, introduced into the new segment on TV with a byline that says, "Oh, um, Ben Fraser Lee, Benjamin Lee, the person responsible for making sure Kevin Hart didn't host Oscars." No one will remember you in a couple of weeks or in a month. He, people, I only know it because I had this in my notes for a long time. No one will know who the fuck you are. It's fucking insane, absolutely insane. 
But yeah, hopefully with changes in the new year, we see a kind of shift. But I'm seeing a little bit of a I think if this would have happened at the beginning of last year, I think Kevin Hart would have been done. I think nowadays, I think people are a bit more forgiving, understand that this whole public outrage thing has got a little bit OTT, it's got a little bit crazy. And people are now seeing that we kind of need to come down to, we kind of need to be, um, we kind of need to get back to a level of civility and kind of, you know, understand that people can make mistakes and they can also grow from it. But you need to allow them to make a mistake, apologize, make amends and give an opportunity to show that they're going to make it again. But, you know, chastising somebody, making them apologize 10, 17 times isn't a way forward to go, in my opinion, personally. But again, what do I know? Anyway, that's an hour and maybe a bit there. I've got a jet off now. Um, This is Jackson Zinger Show, episode number 141. Thanks. Is it 141? I think it's 141. should be anyway. Thanks so much for tuning in. As always, for more information regarding me and everything to do with moi, visit my website. You can find that in the show description, accidentalzinger.com. Obviously, this podcast is sponsored by Audible, the best place to get your audio books, over 400,000 titles narrated by the authors themselves, which helps to bring the books to life. You can find a link to get one free book credit and a 30-day free trial to kickstart your January New Year's, Eve, New Year's Eve resolutions. Hopefully, some of you guys are still on it now. It's Tuesday the 8th. I mean, some people are probably ducked out of it, but hopefully not. And I'll see you guys again on the other side for another episode of the Excellent Zinger Show. But until then, until then, my compadres, peace out.